Monfield Public Library, the Monfield Township Board of Education Administrative Office Building, the district website, and advertised in the daily record for the official newspaper on January 15, 2022. Okay, this is a special meeting of the Board of Education. There's only one item on the agenda. It's a presentation by Dr. Richard Grip of an outfit called um, Demographic, I'm sorry, and Statistical, Statistical Forecasting, LLC. Uh, Dr. Grip did a study for us several years earlier. Things have changed. We're redoing this and letting Dr. Grip share his uh, analysis of the latest studies. As I said, there's no action not on the agenda. There's no public participation per se. However, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Rovatar and uh, Dr. Grip. You made that introduction beautifully, Mr. Obama. I did just want to note that unfortunately Mr. Grau had a, a minor incident and he was uh, unable to join us tonight. Um, but we are recording uh, the meeting, so we will post that, and folks who are not able to join us will uh, be able to uh, view the meeting that way. So without any further ado, I am happy to introduce Dr. Grip uh, for his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rovatar. Uh, I have to say it's exciting to be here, even though we all have masks on, and I'm just happy to just talk to a few folks rather than over Zoom. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Um, so as, as we had talked about, uh, the study was recently completed, I'd say just uh, maybe a couple months ago. So tonight, what I'm planning on doing is talking about the highlights of the study. It's about 70 uh, some odd pages. So. Uh, it's kind of hard to condense into a short amount of time. I figure this is going to take about 20 to 25 minutes on my end, and then I'll turn it over to the board for questions and then the public. Um, so my firm's been around since about 1998. Um, we've been um, working with school districts primarily in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. However, that's been extending down to uh, Virginia, doing a lot of work down there. We are the demographic um, consultant for the New York City Public Schools since 2006 largest school district in the nation. I'm actually going to take this off, it's okay. I'd like to wander around. Um, so, so as again, this is a niche field. It's referred to as school demography. And um, school demographers, we I keep telling um, people who have kids to go into this field because there's so few of us that do this kind of thing. Probably in the state of New Jersey, there's probably about three or four of us, nationally about a hundred. So again, Talk to me if you got kids that want to go into mathematics at some point. So I'm the executive director, um, like I said, started in 1998. I have a, a doctor in ed stats and measurement from Rutgers University. Actually started my public school teaching career right here in 1992, 30 years ago. Taught physics and, st and just physics here and then moved on to Bridgewater Raritan where I taught about eight, nine years in uh, in that school for statistics and physics. Um, I love to publish in this. This is something, this is my passion. Um, so I have a lot of journal articles out there in the field in this, and I've also testified with respect to school districts who really want to divorce. It would not happen in something like this, of course, but some towns have um, a sending receiving agreement where they send their high school students to a particular district, and you can't just get up and walk away. You have to go into the courts, and I'm an expert in school demographer to make sure that uh, there's no racial imbalance and things like that after students leave. So what do we look at when we do a study? So everyone thinks one thing. They think enrollments, projections, and that's it. But what you're going to learn tonight is that we study a lot more than that because everything, all the data that we collect is almost adding up to a bigger picture of, of what it tells what's going on. So. We do an enrollment projection for five years, as you can see up there, from 22-23 to 26-7, 26-27 school year. The number one question I usually get, which I'm probably going to head off right at the pass right now, is why can't you go out 10, 15, 20 years, okay? And the big problem becomes is then we have to start projecting kids who have not been born yet. Can we do that? Well, we can for larger places like New York City. But for Montville Township, the error rates would be just way too high, and I wouldn't put any stake on that data whatsoever. So the State Department of Ed will only take enrollment projections out five years, and that's it. Other things we look at, we look at the community population trends. 
um, historical populations. We look at demographic characteristics, socioeconomic characteristics, which we'll see in a moment. We look at the age structure of the community. We look at birth data and fertility rates because births help to determine kindergarten students five years later. Next thing we looked at, moving away from the township down to the school district level, we looked at the historical enrollments that have happened over the last decade. Not only district-wide, but elementary, middle, and high school grade configurations, and also at the school level. The next thing we did was, um, this was a special option that the board selected. It's something called a student yield analysis. And what it is, it determines the number of children that are in your township per housing unit by housing unit type. So for detached single family homes, townhouses, condos, apartments, how many kids do you typically get out of a particular housing unit? And why do you want to know that? Well, because if you have a lot of new housing starts, we can then use those values, the average value per housing unit, to determine how many kids would come out of those particular developments. The next thing we looked at is how are you doing in terms of seating of in your building, your capacities, compared to the actual enrollments now and projected enrollments in the future. And finally, we talked about new housing, right? We, we contact planning and zoning in the township and ask them how many new housing starts are going to be um, either approved or either under construction. We'll talk more about that later. And what's the impact on the district? So that's the overview of what was accomplished here. Okay, so this is Montville's historical and projected populations. Everything to the left of this, um, this vertical line up here is from the census. And 2020, as you're aware, was an interesting year with the pandemic and also for the census. <laughs> Most of their data, even though we're in 2022, has not been released. The only thing we really have is population counts and population by race and if something regarding the number of housing units and very, very little else, which we should be getting some more, I think, by late spring. But what you can see here is that most of the population growth in uh, Montville happened in the, uh, the 60s on up all the way through. In the 90s, there was a lot of housing. So 22,450 is the population in 2020. Everything to the right is from a third party agency. I did not do those projections. For 2030 and 2040, the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority projects where Montville is going. However, I should tell you that those values are based on the 2010 census. So they have not adjusted their numbers based on the 2020 counts as of yet. And I suspect that once they do, those numbers on the right hand side of the screen will go up. Maybe in the 23,000 to 24,000 range. So who are you as a community? Now we go a little more into the demographic characteristics. So the community is becoming more racially diverse. About two thirds white. You can see 21% Asian, 7% Hispanic. In the last 10 years, you're having a declining white population and an increasing Hispanic and Asian population. Is that unusual? The answer is no. If you look at the demographics in the country, we are becoming um, less white and more racially diverse. At some point, we'll be a, a majority minority at some point. I think it's around 2050 or 2060 is what we're gaming, uh, projecting. So the median age is slightly higher than the state. Why do we look at that? Well, we want to see if you have an older community, you may not be generating that many children because you know, once you're over a certain age, you're not going to have kids. Foreign-born population, pretty close to the state average, 21% almost, 23% of the state is foreign-born. India and China are the largest sources of the foreign-born population. Very educated communities. Next two uh, bullets are socioeconomic status. This is a very educated community, 63% with a bachelor's degree or higher. And income levels are about $60,000 more than the state median household income. For those people who did not take statistics, median is not the same as mean. Right, mean is an average, and median is the 50th percentile, which means 50% of the data is above a point and 50% is below a point. Almost 8,000 housing units, most of them are single family, one unit homes, either detached homes or maybe townhouses. Very small renter population, 14%, which makes my job easier. 
because a lot of renters would mean a lot of migration of people moving in and out of the school district for kids. And the last thing is the median value of an owner-occupied unit is almost 600000 Again, almost 50% 50, 50 of the housing units have a value more than 600000 in this community. Okay, so here's just a map of the township. You've probably seen that a million times in the times that you've lived here. And all the, all the schools are just pointed out on the map there, but that's not really the more interesting one. The next one is, this is showing the elementary attendance areas. You have five elementary schools, and you can see um, for Mason, Hilldale, Cedar Hill, Valley View, and Woodmont what the attendance area boundaries are. So if a child lives in a particular zone, that's where they go to school. But what's interesting, in the little corner down here in the bottom, I don't know if this pointer works, let's see. Yep, there we go. See that little green spot? That's in the Woodmont section. I think it's an apartment complex. It could be Rachel Gardens. Yes, okay, and that actually goes to Hilldale. So it's not in the closest um, elementary attendance area. All right, let's talk about the school district now. So the enrollment as of October 15th in 2021, just this past October, was 3,371 students. And the reason why we're using opt October 15th count, not today or yesterday or the day before, is because we always use the data that is sent to the state on what we call like our state census day, which is October the 15th. And it falls on a weekend, maybe October 17th. But that's the date that we collect the enrollment data to send to the state. So in the last decade, the enrollments have been steadily declining here. If we jump back 10 years to the 2012-13 year, you can see the enrollment was over 4,000, about 4,022 and a half, which is a part-time student. So you've lost 651 and a half students in the last 10 years. We use something called the cohort survival ratio method to project enrollments, and that is something that is approved by the State Board of Ed, and I will talk about that in a moment. There is a picture of the K-12 enrollments over time, and you can see it's just steadily going downwards. But I can give you a piece of good news if you don't like declining enrollment. It can't last forever because you're not going down to zero. So this is probably, if you're going to fall asleep, don't fall asleep on this one slide. This is an important one. Um, this is the elementary, middle, and high school enrollment over time. And I usually refer to it as the window to the future slide because it reflects what's going to happen in the future. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have declining enrollment at the elementary level, those smaller cohorts have to move up into the middle and eventually the high. So you have a good idea of what's going to happen just by looking right here. What I find really interesting is, yeah, we've had declining enrollment here for the last decade, right? But take a look at what's happening at the elementary level right here. You had this decline right about here, and for the last five years, you got this stabilization going on. That's usually what I refer to as the beginning of an inflection point where things start to go back the other way, okay? But... That does not mean that you're not gonna have declining enrollment because you still have to move smaller cohorts through the system. So take a look here, you can see the middle school declining over the last decade, high school, same thing, okay? So what is the cohort survival ratio method? Okay, this is for the math people out there. The rest of you just hang in there for a few minutes. Um, what we're doing is we're computing what's called a survival ratio or a grade progression ratio from one grade to the next over time. And we do this for all the grade levels. So I give a simple example. So if you have 100 first graders in 2021 school year, the next year, which is this year, 21-22, let's say you only get 95 advanced to second grade. You lost five somewhere in there in the net because of people going in and out of the school district. That's outward migration. Any value that we get where the value is 95 over 100 in this particular case, when the values are below one, we have a loss of students or outward migration. When it's above one, you have inward migration. So in this particular example, when we did your district, there are 13 possible ratios, birth to kindergarten, all the way up through 11 through 12. Thir of those 13, 10, in the average, in the last five years, we're above one. What does that mean? Well, in the net, you're gaining students in inward migration into the district. Just not enough to, to stem 
the declining enrollment that is occurring. Of the ones, of the 10 ratios, all, all the ratios at the elementary level are above one. No surprise. Okay, parents want to get their kids in here to be educated. It's no surprise to me at all. Where are we seeing the ratios below one? At the high school level. Again, not really surprising because we do see students that go to private schools at that level. So we use an average ratio for each of these grade progressions, and we assume that those ratios are going to hold constant over time. So we multiply the ratios times the current enrollment and all the ratios that are all the enrollments thereafter for the next five years, and that's how you get your projections. And we do some modifying based on housing and things like that. So you have a phenomenon here called negative kindergarten replacement, and it's been happening even before, uh, not only the last nine years, but even when I was here the last time. And it's happened um, where you're losing 50 to 113 students per year. And what it is, it's when the number of entering kindergarten students is less than the number of 12th grade students leaving the prior year. Let me give you a simple example. Say you have 300 seniors graduating high school. To match, to keep your enrollment level, you need 300 kindergarten students to enter the district the following year. You're never getting enough kindergarten students to match what's leaving in the 12th grade population. Okay, eventually that's going to have that's going to change. So here's what it's looked like over time. There's always a deficit. You're always down out of the gate because you're not enough kindergarten students coming in to balance out those seniors that are leaving. All right, let's talk about BERTs. BERTs are used to project kindergarten students five years later. That's the best we can do. I know a lot of things can happen between births and a kindergarten student coming five years later, but we do find a strong correlation uh, of, um, between births and kindergarten students. From 2007 to 2019, that's the period we looked at, there was a period of declining in birth rates, but in the last year, eight years, things have begun to stabilize. Now, what a surprise, because I just showed you a graph a few moments ago showing stabilization in the elementary enrollment. It's all starting to put together, and you can see the pieces now, how it works. You can see there's the decline right here. And then, you know, you got to look, kind of got to look for here. It's more of that stabilization that I was talking about. Yeah, you got these up and downs, but, you know, it's fairly stable. So when we look at the one particular survival ratio of those 13 I just mentioned, I'd love to look at the birth to kindergarten one. Because if we look at the number of births and how many kindergartens show up five years later, we do the math, we divide the students by the births, you get the last column in red. And the reason I highlight it in red is because all the ratios are not just above one, but they're really above one. They're, they're, is significantly above one, meaning that there's a lot of students that come into your district that were born in other communities, not just in Montville. Okay, they're moving in, people are moving in with children under the age of five to get their kids to start school here. So in some years, you're getting a 30% gain in students um, from how many were born five years prior. So this is where we start getting more into the weeds. Um, we have the ability to get birth data from the Department of Health, all the, all the data from the Department of Health, but not just for the township, but we get it by an area called the census block. And then we do some GIS work, which stands for Geographic Information Systems, to count how many births actually occurred in each of the different attendance areas that you currently have. And the last count, this is what we're showing, births by attendance area over time, the unknowns are Montville mothers who we know live in Montville, but we didn't have a specific address for where they live, so we couldn't figure out which attendance area they would belong to for the births. But the reason I show this slide is to show you a couple things. First of all, in purple, down here in the bottom, I'm showing the, the, the attendance areas that had the highest and the least amount of births over this point in time. And you can see Woodmont had, Woodmont had the most followed by Hilldale, and then Valley View had the least. And if you compare the 2007 births to the 2019 births, is there really much of a difference? Well, you know, that's only two years you're looking at, but you can see 
that Woodmont and Valley View have had pretty big declines in the number of births over time, whereas Hilldale and Cedar Hill have had slight gains. So when we actually do a map showing the births by attendance area, dark blue would be the, num the greatest number of births, and this is for 2007. So I advance it to 2019, and what do we get? Well, we don't have Woodmont being the largest in terms of number of births. We actually have um, Hilldale. And now I'm going to show you the births by census block. So these are all blocks, and there can be, usually a block is bordered by a street, um, sometimes water, things like that. But the darkest blue is what you want to focus on. Because that, according to our scale, and we're going to use the same scale for the next slide, this is for 2007, shows you the greatest number of births by census block. So we advance it to 2019, and you can see the greatest number of births is still occurring down toward Woodmont. Okay, I can go back and forth, this is 2007. So more blues and more greens would mean more births, but it's just shifted around. Okay, Demography 101, age pyramids. It's really showing us here the percentage of males and females in each age class over time. This is going to be from the 2010 census. So what you see here is that the greatest number of males and females, males in orange, females in green, the 45 to 49 group is the largest group in the, in the age pyramid. And in affluent communities, what we see and typically with the baby boomer population, we see a big chunk of people in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and we don't see too many people down in the 20s and 30s because they can't afford to live here. Um, they just cannot afford the prices, they cannot afford the property taxes. I could take your, your particular community and put another town in Morris County and we'll see the same thing. So if there's not much migration occurring. If we advance it 10 years later, what would you expect to see? Well, you would expect the largest groups just to advance up, you know, five or 10 years and become the largest age group 10 years later, um, assuming not too much mortality. But we don't have 2020 census data as of yet. We have something called now the 2015 to 19 ACS, which is a lousy data set with 1% samples per year but it gives us a kind of an estimate of what the age sex diagram would look like. And what we see, ironically, is that the 10 to 14 age group for males is now the largest, and the 45 to 49, which was the largest in 2010 for females, has stayed that way. So since it's not the lar next, next age group up, there is definitely migration occurring in the township. And if we look over that time period, where the greatest decliners and where the gainest, biggest gainers are. In red, we see the biggest decliners. It, for males, was the uh, five to nine, which is kindergarten to four population. For females, the 40 to 44 group. And the biggest gainers, 70 to 74. So this is probably the big elephant in the room coming up, is the number of new housing units that are coming online in Montville Township. There's the potential for over a thousand non-age restricted housing units. And um, if you're not aware, Montville um, created a settlement agreement with the Fair Share Housing Center in September of 2019 to address its affordable housing obligation. And with that, there's going to have to be some affordable housing units built in the township. So out of those 1,006 units, about 15% or 149 are going to be affordable units to meet that obligation. All this information that you, you're seeing here is from the Montville Township Planning and Zoning Department. They were very, very cooperative. There's, the, the report has about two pages worth of developments to, to sift through if you're really interested. But the largest impact would be on the Woodmont and Mason attendance areas for the elementary schools. 85% of the homes are going to be located in those two zones. So after I made some looking at the consideration of all the new housing, once I could perform the enrollment projections, which I call baseline projections, I modified them to account for the new housing starts. And we'll talk about how I do that in a moment. 
We did something called a student yield analysis, which I talked about in the beginning tonight, which is where we look at the number of children per housing unit in different housing types. So the way we do this is we take the student address debate database provided by the school district for the 21-22 school year, and we join it to the property database that's provided to us by the state for Montville Township. And I'm gonna give you the overview of what we learned. First of all, for a detached single family home, you're getting about 0.91 children per housing unit. In my experience, that's a lot uh, for a K-12. You may not think so, but it is. Um, townhouse condo and apartments are multifamily types of property. They do not yield as many children as a detached single family home. So that's important to realize because if we had a thousand detached single family homes being built here, you would have a lot of children. But because of these multifamily type units, it's gonna be a lot less than you may think. So for townhouses, the average is about 0.26 children per unit, townhouses and condos, and I'll show you what we learned in a moment more specifically. For apartments, it's 0.32, and to be honest with you, that's really one big complex, Rachel Gardens. And so what we figured, after all these units, about 395 public school children are projected. And it's because you might think it would be more. But again, multifamily units do not generate as much children. And that's a rough estimate because as much as we got information from the planning and zoning department, what they were not able to give us in some, time, some occasions was the bedroom distributions. If we don't have the bedroom distributions, a three bedroom yields a lot, lot more children than a one bedroom. So we're making some estimations then on our end of what the bedroom distribution is going to be for a development. And of course, that may not be the case. And those, the problems were for the apartment and townhouse developments that are um, projected. So this is your actual student yields currently. For all the townhouse developments, we did a lot of internet research. Um, my employee did a, tons of scouring through njcondos.net and other sources. But what it shows you is the name of the development, the approximate sales price, year built, number of bedrooms, number of units, and how many children, public school children from your school district are in each one of those developments. And what we find that's interesting, we compute the student yield, which is simply the total number of students divided by the number of units. Brandywine has the largest student yield out of all the townhouse developments, followed by the Meadows, but they are also larger. They have two and three bedroom units. If we move off to, so the overall yield for the township is down in the right-hand corner here, 0.264. If we do the same analysis for the apartments, many of the apartment complexes are very small, except for Rachel Gardens, which is mostly one and two bedroom units, but it has a mixture of market rate and affordable units. It's not purely market rate, it has both. I have the breakdown in my notes up there, but if anyone wants to know, I can tell you. So the average yield for apartments is 0.323, but again, it's really, None of these other developments had any children, so Rachel Gardens is really yielding where all the students are for apartments. So why don't we look at home sales? Well, home sales are a great indicator of um, the market. Um, the real estate market is a good indicator of how many children will come in, because in strong housing markets, such as what we're in right now, you probably are going to have a family buying a home with children. It's not going to be an empty nester. It's not, it's not a place like this. So this is showing over time from 1994, you see this big decline here with the number of home sales. This happened over here in the 2008 period to 2012 with the, the mortgage and banking crisis. You're probably aware of that. Nobody could probably even sell their homes. It was very hard at that point. No one wanted to put their homes on the market. Things have improved, but even as 2020, 426 sales, I think that is, or 428, I can't see but it's, it's a little bit lower than what it was prior to the housing market crash, but still fairly strong. Our GIS analyst took all the student addresses from the last six years and all the sales and geocoded them, which means popped them onto a map and then aggregated it by census block to see where the greatest number of home sales are occurring. And in dark blue, that's showing that in Hilldale, 
and over here um, in Cedar Hill. So if you know where your house is and you sold your house in the last six years, um, you can probably see in this map where a lot of this is. So let's get to the, the final part of the presentation tonight, which is the enrollment projections. So there are two different projections I ran. One is referred to as the baseline projections, which means what if the housing developments that we talk about in the report don't come to fruition or they are not built and occupied within the next five years, which could happen. So that's one set of very, very, very conservative set of numbers. The bottom set is now adjusting for all the new housing units in the attendance areas that we talked about of where these things are going to occur. Now I'm going to have to reach for my notes on this one because I can't remember all this off the top of my head, but what you'll be interested to know is that for the baseline projections, the, uh, if, if, if the housing does not occur, you're looking at a loss of about 158 students in the next five years. So things would continue to decline. But if we factor in the housing, quite the opposite. If the housing all does occur, you're looking at a gain of about 179 students over the next five years. With or without the new housing, you're looking at a decline at the high school configuration as those smaller cohorts continue to move through the system. Um, at the baseline projections, the elementary and the middle high school, the elementary and the middle school grade configurations in the baseline really aren't going to change that much. They're starting to stabilize. But in the adjusted projections, the elementary and middle are projected to increase. Okay, this is nearing the end with the capacity analysis, which is showing us the capacity of the building as you're currently using it in well, that was when it was calculated in 2020. The enrollment in the 21-22 year, the difference, if the number is red, we refer to that as having unhoused students or being over capacity. If it's blue, you have a surplus in seating. And then the projected enrollment five years later, and again, the same thing, red for uh, unhoused students or shortage of seating and blue for surplus. So a couple things of note, please. The capacity that you see up there is not a hard and fixed value, like a, a fire code type capacity. The capacity is computed in your long range facility plan, which the architects for your district would compute for you, based upon how you are currently using the building. So let me give you an example. If a school has 20 classrooms and your policy for educating children is 20 students to a classroom, it's simple math. 20 times 20 is 400, that's the capacity you're building. If you have more special ed classrooms in that particular building, it will lower the capacity because you cannot put 20 special ed kids in a classroom. So it's, it's a fluid number on how you are using the building. And that, this is why I put the date of the capacity up there because two years is past, you may be using them completely different. But based upon what we've seen from 2020, what this is showing is that at the elementary level, most of the buildings are either right around capacity or slightly above. And in the next five years, that's going to really get exacerbated, particularly at Woodmont, Cedar Hill, and Mason. Um, a lot of that has to do, now those numbers that I'm using for projected enrollment, those are the higher values from the adjusted for housing growth. Okay, it's not the, the baseline numbers, okay, because I wanted to show you the worst case scenario. So you might have some issues you know, with capacity in the, this part of the next five years with those buildings. At Lazar, you can see due to the increase that's projected there, you would go from a surplus to a shortage of seating. And at the high school, it's going to be the reverse. You might have a shortage of seating currently, but due to the continued decline I've been talking about, these smaller cohorts moving through the system, you'll have a surplus. So I cannot possibly end this presentation without talking about COVID. Um, from a demographer's standpoint, this has been by far the most challenging year of my professional career. I like probably the challenging last two years. It has thrown everything that we've done completely out the window in some cases. And it's just because 
There are so many things that have happened, as you know, in the last couple of years. Parents are not sending their kids to school. They're homeschooling them. They're going to private school. They're, they're moving to remote locations. Are they coming back? You know, who knows? Um, I live in Vermont now. I don't live in New Jersey anymore. I've been living up there quite some time. We've had declining enrollment for about 20 some odd years, brain drain state. And in the last year, we in some towns are gaining 15%. And it's because people are moving out of the cities. They're buying up properties up by us. And um, some of them have second homes, so they're just moving into them. We don't know if they're going to stay in Vermont or they're moving back to New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Mass. Those are the places that most people go, come from. And you can see that there are some school districts around the country that have had massive declines. And I can't even tell you how big New York City's been, but it's a very, very large decline. Um, so, you know, this whole idea about people living in second homes due to the pandemic, you know, will they have to go back to work in an office? You know, I think those days are over. I think we're going to see some type of hybrid approach, which is very difficult to interpret mathematically how this is going to affect enrollments. Um, I have worked with some districts in the state where we studied their withdrawals of students. And this one district in, in southern New Jersey had 124 withdrawals last year. 40 of them were in kindergarten. So where are those, where are the withdrawals? They're always in the lower elementary grades. I wouldn't want to send my kid to, to school in, in the pandemic last year, so but it's different with a vaccine now. So, you know, that was some of the considerations. So, takeaways from tonight. Number one, enrollment is projected to increase because of those 1,000 1, new housing starts. Without them, you would continue to decline. Number two, that is number two, if not for new housing, they would have continued the decline trend. So with that, I probably ran over my 25 minutes I said I was gonna do, but since I'm on the only item on the agenda, maybe it's not so bad. Um, but uh, I'm gonna open up to questions. So Dr. Rotar, I'll turn it back to you and you can go from there. FES or facility efficiency standards. FES is from the state what the uh, rec FES recommended class sizes should be. District practices is how you are using the building based upon your board policies of how many children per classroom. These values up here on the left are all district practices value, not, not based on FES recommended. So it's based upon you know, the values that your architect took from from you guys in terms of how you're using the building and that's how the capacities were generated. I just took it off your long range facility plan. And I don't know what the FES numbers are, so are they higher than ours? They're, they're usually lower. Usually. Yeah, usually, so particularly for middle and high school, it's the way the buildings are being used. What, what counts as an FES recommended, uh, FES uh, generating space for, for capacity, because some, some places like this, an auditorium, may not count as anything because you really don't have anybody being educated here. The cafeteria, same thing. So I'm not an architect, so I really can't get into the weeds too much with that, but that's what I know from just working over the years with those folks. Okay, thank you. I have one last question. Sure. And it's probably to Renee. You're not gonna be here, unfortunately, in when these numbers come to fruition. But in your estimate, in your best guess, are we looking at redistricting? of the elementary I, I think we now need to have a conversation now that we have the study and I think now that we have the study and it's been presented, I think we're looking at how, at the district doing some work with these numbers and taking a look at uh, how this uh, plays out over the five elementary schools. So I. I think all things are up for consideration, and I think that we'll, we'll work through that in the process. But bringing up the microphone, are we looking at having enough capacity to house all the projected students? We need to make sure that we have that capacity. It's just how we accomplish that. That's what the discussion needs to be. Okay, so we're looking at maybe new classrooms, trailers? Kind of thing. I, I'm sorry I'm pushing you on this, but... We're not there yet. We need, we need to have that discussion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you. And one thing with, the, with respect to the new housing, 
Uh, one of the things I had to do, and it's very difficult, I have to assume when these things are going to be occupied and completely constructed. And, you know, I don't have a magic, magic ball I'm looking into or a crystal ball, but I basically go on whether it's approved, and then I figure it'll probably take two years. If it's not approved, I push it out a little further. So I have this sort of matrix of, of uh, decision rules of where I put occupation to occur. So, you know, this is, again, it's not hard and fast with the housing. It's very challenging to figure that out, but it gives you kind of an idea of what, what, what to expect. Good evening, thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope one day to visit Vermont myself. Great place. <laughs> so I just have a question. We had the big buildup of new construction in the late 90s, myself included, we built our home. There are vacant parcels available. Um, and I drive by and they're for sale. Was the planning board or town hall able to give you any data of vacant land that builders are looking to build? Because like you said, a single family home, you could have four kids, you could have three kids. And I was just wondering if they gave you that data and how we could consider that into the schools. So one thing that this study does not look at is a land use analysis of commercial, residential, vacant. Uh, because it becomes a lot of what ifs, you know, and when, you know, we really don't know if that vacant land will turn into something down the line. So we really have to narrow our focus on what we're looking at. And that's just uh, developments that are in some type of application stage before the planning board in approval status or under construction. So, you know, if there is say a five acre tract, it's up for sale. We don't include that, and they don't provide that to us either. You're welcome. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Greg, for being here tonight. Just a couple of questions. Um, based on uh, what you discussed with us tonight, we can expect about 395 school children from the projected You also mentioned that uh, projected enrollment would increase by approximately 179. So that 179, is that like a net from our declining enrollment versus our influx of students? That's a great question. Did everybody hear that? Because I'm not sure. So if there's 395 new children expected, why is not the gain from the baseline to the adjusted 395 students? It's 179. It's a great question. Here's a couple things that are going on. First of all, students that, on the way I distribute students is per grade level. So, you know, so in 2022 year, we have students that are distributed from K to 12. Well, a lot of those students are graduating out of the, stu out of the district that are new. So you're not gonna capture all 395 at the end of the five year period because over that five year period, they continue to graduate out of the school district. That's number one. The second reason why the numbers don't add up the way you, you might think is that we take a look at the historical period in each one of the attendance zones to see how many new houses were built and how many children were, came from those houses because you can't just add all the new houses into each of the attendance zones without considering the historical period because that would be double counting because what's happening is with the new, with the historical period, you're actually getting the cohort survival ratios to increase because those new students who came in from the new houses are now in the school district. So we have to factor them out. So you're really getting 395, but for the purpose of the projections, that net is coming down based upon the historical number of students, students from new housing. That's why. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, just one more question. Um, you mentioned in your report that the Jew group project, that was Yes, that, that has been included. In fact, don't know which page, but it'll actually show you the number of students that is projected from that particular development, and that was put into the, the numbers you see behind me. Mm -hmm. Sure.
Come on, I love questions. I love, when I get to talk about this, my wife doesn't want to hear me talk about any of this. So someone, please. Dr. Grip for an excellent presentation. Um, this will all be on the website for everyone's perusal. And seeing there's no other questions from the audience, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. That's it. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Have a good night, everyone.